nothing but resolute courage and firm, unshakable confidence in God can enable us to persist in this combat. Brother in Christ, Laudate Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. We continue our series reading through Boylan's book, Difficulties in Mental Prayer. This is an offering to the Fellowship of St. Anthony, and we are releasing this episode uh, publicly to promote our guild and our fellowship. The Fellowship of St. Anthony is a lay sodality, which offers up penances for clergy and seminarians. We abstain from meat every Wednesday and Friday, and then we take on further penances for Advent as well as for Lent. So this is our response to corruption in the clergy is to offer up penances. This is what we believe to be the, a Catholic response. And one of the things we do is we read through spiritual books. So we uh, have a penance rule, uh, further rules as well. And then we read through these spiritual books. So I've been recording the audio of this book, Difficulties in Mental Prayer. And so today we're going to read through chapter 11. And uh, so if you want to join the Fellowship of St. Anthony, all of these videos are posted in the Telegram group for the Fellowship of St. Anthony, and as well as the link to the full playlist. Uh, so here's the full place that, playlist we have so far of this book. Um, and you can go back and read through or listen through all those chapters uh, of this fantastic modern spiritual work. Um, and so, as I said, we'll go through chapter 11 today. And uh, if you're a part of the guild and you want to join the Fellowship of St. Anthony, you can just contact me. But in your welcome email, you get a link to join the Fellowship of St. Anthony. You can just review the requirements. Uh, so in order to become a part of the fellowship, you have to join the guild, which is making a financial and a prayerful contribution to our apostolate. And then the Fellowship of St. Anthony is the additional penance requirements. So um, all of these videos get posted every week in that Telegram group and nowhere else. Okay, let's continue. Difficulties in Mental Prayer, Chapter 11, The Path of Progress. There is another consideration which makes it desirable, if indeed it is not also necessary, that the different ways of prayer should be put before every priest and every religious, and this not merely as a speculative knowledge having no relation to practice, but as practical methods of prayer that everyone may have occasion to employ. But it needs some introduction in the form of a discussion of the path by which we ascend to the heights of prayer. It is quite true that there is an age-old division of the spiritual life into three stages, those namely of beginners, proficients, and the perfect dating almost from apostolic times. It is true also that pr progress in prayer has been divided into three ways corresponding to each of these stages. It is further true that the rising path of prayer has been divided into various steps by such great authorities as St. Teresa and by many theologians of experience and renown. To this tradition of treatment, to this weight of precedent and this example of practice might be added the kind of suggestions of those whose advice was sought in penning these lines recommending definite divisions of the spiritual life into well-marked steps with detailed definitions of each type of prayer and classified treatment of the difficulties arising in each class. Yet we have deliberately refrained from too exact an attempt at definition and also from any clean-cut classification of the different stages in the growth of prayer with well-marked divisions between each stage. In doing so, we do not question for a moment the truth of the principles latent in such a scientific procedure as that of tradition. But this is not a theoretical textbook discussing the difficulties of prayer in general or abstract terms. It is rather an attempt to help individual souls to deal with their own difficulties. And it looks at the spiritual life, not a scientific, objective manner, but from the subjective point of view of the individual, treating it as it appears to the individual in practice. Now, if the experience of a large number of souls of different age, experience, temperament, and time be taken and averaged out, it will be found that the classical divisions and conclusions are quite accurate and well justified. But if one were to measure a number of men, take the average of their different dimensions, and make a suit of clothes according to these average measurements, the probability is that there would hardly be any one man whom the suit would fit properly. So it is with prayer. 
the experiences of each individual and the way in which it seems to him that his prayer develops are not to be brought under the letter of a general law. In particular, wide variations will be found in the sequence in which the different degrees of prayer succeed one another. Even in those whose path most closely follows the classical signposts, meditation, affective prayer, simplified prayer, arid contemplation, prayer of union, etc., these divisions only represent an average over a period in which one particular type of prayer predominated. It is even not impossible that in the stage marked meditation, there were times when each of the other types of prayer were practiced. It is unlikely, of course, that all were there. Quite conservatively minded authors point out that a number of souls start with affective prayer. Many general beginners have been given, for a short time at least, the graces of contemplation. The task of prescribing for each soul must thus be approached with an open mind and a full selection of prescriptions. In addition to this variety apparently inherent in the nature of the case, it would seem that in view of the necessities of these critical times and the fearful strength of the forces in active opposition to Christianity, God is even more ready than usual to pour out his generous graces of prayer on souls who are willing to make use of them. No matter what his state in life, there is hardly any soul who sets himself seriously to the pursuit of prayer and of holiness, of whom it could be said that with any confidence that he will not be offered the highest graces of prayer. Therefore, it would seem desirable that every soul should have a practical knowledge of the different ways of praying and should be prepared to use each according to varying, the varying conditions of grace, of fervor, and of the general weather of his spiritual life. That means that he should be prepared to go up higher if God invites him and should be ready with equal cheerfulness and holy indifference to resume the tedious task of meditation if, all else failing, this should become profitable. That is not to assert that there will be no general development of his prayer. All that has been written here makes it clear that in a healthy spiritual life, even such growth is almost inevitable. But it is very probable that the course of prayer looked at from day to day will manifest all sorts of variations and call for a command of various methods. It is noteworthy that St. John of the Cross includes under the one term, that of meditation, the different varieties of prayer that we have been discussing. That is why exact definitions or clear delineation have been avoided. One can define terms with accuracy, but clear definition of states presupposes the existence of quite distinct and definite definitions, divisions in the growth of prayer, which are not so easy to find in practice, especially when looked for in the case of an individual soul. It is even a task of great difficulty to mark out the borderline between the general stage of ordinary prayer and the beginning of what many call infused contemplation. If, therefore, a certain indefiniteness is apparent in the present treatment of the development of prayer, it is because this seems to be more in accordance with the facts of individual, individual experience. That is also why one may feel justified in treating the difficulties of the different ways of praying in an unclassified way. There's one weapon, one way, that is essential for dealing with all difficulties and for making progress in prayer. That is a firm resolution never to cease trying, never to give up praying, no matter what difficulties arise, no matter how small the measure of success, no matter what the cost is going to be. When we decide to become men of prayer, we make a declaration of war, not only on our lower selves, but on the devil himself. Nothing but resolute courage and firm, unshakable confidence in God can enable us to persist in that combat. But if we are generous and do our best, even if that be little more than to glory in our infirmities, then we can be sure of God's assistance. For it is a theological principle that to those who use what little grace they may already possess, God will not refuse his further grace. There is one difficulty, a most common one, which will test the strength of this resolution. That is, the continual struggle against distractions. These troubles may, of course, have their origin outside prayer, in some attachment, some unmortified curiosity, some morbid brooding over humiliations, for example. They may be due to failure to recollect oneself generously and completely at the beginning of the prayer. In these cases, the remedy is obvious. They may, however, be due to fatigue. For if the powers of the mind are hard at work all day, it is not easy for them to make the effort necessary to remain attentive to what may be a very difficult task. 
In this case, when the distracting work is of God's appointing and not due to our own self-seeking, we can only glory in our infirmities and hope in God's grace. Again, distractions may be due to the natural instability of the mind, especially of the imagination. It is a psychological law that one idea tends to call up another according to the well-known principles of association and contrast, so that the very effort to make one idea clear may be the means of starting the distraction. Distractions, again, may arise from the fact that the subject of our prayer or the workings of God's grace make no appeal, appeal to the imagination, to our natural tastes, or even to the more familiar part of our intellectual powers. In this latter case, especially, the imagination and its attendants seem to run riot, and any attempt to recall them will only draw away the attention from the real prayer, which is going on in the depths of the soul, in what one might call the invisible light of faith. In all these cases, all we can do is to renew our attention to God according to the way in which we are praying to him. This should be done gently and quietly, without vexation, and even without surprise at our own folly. If we could only realize how much this continual turning back to God shows him our real love for him and pleases him more than that rapt attention that has its roots in self-love, we should never be dissatisfied with our prayer on account of its numerous distractions. If prayer be a lifting up of the mind to God, then every time we turn away from distractions to renew our attention to God, we pray, and we pray in the teeth of difficulties and despite ourselves. What can be more pleasing to God? What more meritorious? We should be very greatly surprised if we could get a glimpse at the account book that the recording angel keeps and see the different values he sees on our various attempts at prayer. The prayer that pleased us and with which we were well satisfied, would often be quite low in his estimate, while the prayer that disgusted us, which was apparently made up of nothing but distractions, might be found to have won a very high degree of his approval. Sometimes the mere return to God is sufficient to banish the distraction, but very often the same distracting thought keeps coming back, despite our attempts to get rid of it. One way of dealing with such obstinate intruders is to make them the subject of prayer. With a little ingenuity, some relation can be found between the distracting idea and God. It may perhaps give us something to pray for. It may serve as a motive to praise God. It could be used as evidence of our need for his grace. Whatever it is, God made it and allowed it to come into our minds so that there is always some way that leads back from it to God. If all else fail, we can fall back upon the advice of the author of the cloud for dealing with distractions that we should endeavor to look over their shoulders as if we were looking at some object beyond them and above them, which is God. There is an excellent chapter on distractions in Holy Wisdom by Father Baker, OSB, a work in which these pages owe much and which is the, of the same tradition. The part of his book that deals with prayer will be found very helpful and has been published separately by Don Weld Blundell, OSB, under the prayer or under the title Prayer and Holiness. Another way of looking at prayer may help us when we feel we cannot pray at all. Let us regard the time of prayer as an appointment with God. If for his own wise reasons, he decides not to keep the appointment, that is his will and therefore to be praised. For our part, by kneeling there, helpless and almost hopeless, we're doing what he wants us to do and we can confidently leave the result to him. These helpless half hours spent fighting sleep and distraction, getting nowhere, as the phrase has it, have a providential part to play in our sanctification. Distractions which are not deliberate are a trial, not a fault. Let us accept them cheerfully and confidently. In his own good time, God will come and save us. End of chapter 11.